All right, so as I said, what we're going to focus on today is building our reusable valuation model using Coca-Cola. As a starting point, which I've already done for you, you would have gone to the Bloomberg lab because we're going to use <clears throat> Bloomberg as a data source for companies. One of the reasons we're going to do that is if we were to go to the Bloomberg lab and type, type in Coke and go to the equity for Coke, under the section FA, which stands for financial analysis, these are where you get historical financial data for companies. And if I click on IS, that's the historical income statement for a company. The first sub-tab is called standardized. What has happened is that somebody who works for Bloomberg has taken the 10Ks and the 10Qs of the companies as they come out, and they basically take the 10K in the company's format and put it into a Bloomberg standardized format. Right? That has huge value to us because that means that we get a, a common template for any company that we use using the Bloomberg service. Now I can also go to the As Reported tab within Bloomberg and see the 10K as it was presented in the 10K. All right? But the advantage of using the standardized template is I could do Coca-Cola, I could do Starbucks, I could do McDonald's, I could do Walmart, and it will always spit out their data in a consistent format. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this data for the income statement, the balance sheet, and the cash flow in the standardized format. We're going to output it to Excel, and it's going to dump the data into three Excel files. Now, as a sample, on Elms, in the Files section, for the Coke valuation, <clears throat> these are the three files that would be outputted. Here's the Coca-Cola income statement data in the standardized format, the balance sheet in the standardized format, and the cash flow in the standardized format. So I've already done that. Now what you're going to do later for your group projects is you're going to do the same thing for your company. You'll dump the data into these three Excel files. Then you'll go to our valuation model. <clears throat> our valuation model is set up in a series of tabs generally works from left to right. The first three tabs is the data dump from Bloomberg in the standardized format. So there's the data from the income statement from Bloomberg, there's the historical data from the balance sheet from Bloomberg, and there's the historical data from the cash flow from Bloomberg. Okay? So I basically took those three data tabs that I exported and I put those as the first three tabs in our model. What we're eventually going to do is we can overwrite the data in these tabs for any company and we're building a reusable model. We're going to start out with Coke's real data as of yesterday, right, with their most recent data highlights that have been put into the model. Question? I know last week you talked about when you pull Excel um, from, or data from Bloomberg uh, to Excel, a lot of the values are pulled from Bloomberg as opposed to actual values. Is it the same thing for these? Yep. So what will happen is you'll copy, paste special values, and I'll talk about it later, so you can actually take the numbers and put it in the spreadsheet. It's a simple process that will take you 10 minutes when you actually do this. That's why next Wednesday in class we'll be able to do a valuation model of another company. It'll take you 20 minutes to basically put the data in. I'll give you the raw data. Right? And we'll do some practice where you have to go to the Bloomberg lab and do this over the next several classes after that. Right? So <clears throat> here's how the model works. We're going to use <clears throat> historical data to help us forecast future data and that future financials will then get us future cash flows which we will then value. So. The model is organized as a series of tabs. The next tab I want to talk about is the income tab. So I've recreated the income statement data in the income tab. All right? And I've done this for two reasons. One, I want to make sure that the data foots. All right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start out with revenue. I'm going to subtract out the expenses. I'm going to make sure that if I subtract all the expenses, I get the same net income that's in the data tab. Because if I have any data integrity issues where everything doesn't add up, then we know that our statements will never balance and it's going to cause us problems with our valuations. I generally don't run into this problem with Bloomberg, but it's good practice regardless because we used to run this problem when I used Thomson Reuters as a data source. That I'd export the data from Thomson Reuters, I'd put in the model and it wouldn't add up because they'd be missing fields. Right? Second reason why we're going to create the income tab is we're going to use the income tab to create the forecast. So it is on this tab that we'll have both the historical data and the forecasted income statements that we're going to create. Same thing for the balance sheet. The balance sheet tab has the recreated balance sheet, in this case for Coca-Cola, 
and then we're going to forecast Coke's balance sheets on this tab as well. <clears throat> There's a new tab called Change in Equity, which I've recreated just to break out the share buybacks and share issues of a company. And it's just so that when we get to the cash flows, we don't just have a, a big equity change. It breaks out the share issue and buyback. I've already created that for you. Then there's the next three economic tabs, TFI, TII, CFI. What I've done here is I've mapped the Bloomberg balance sheet to the TFI already rearranged. So what you did on your midterm exam, I've actually done for you in this model historically. So everything is a relative reference. That's why we want to use the Bloomberg standardized format. But assuming we continue to use the Bloomberg standardized format, the TFI is already done. I did the same thing with the TII and the CFI. Okay, so the economic statements have already been converted. I also did it with the economic profit. And there's two economic profit tabs. One is called EP Boy, which is economic profit based on beginning of year invested capital, which is what we're going to use when we do the valuations. And then there's an EPEOY, which is economic profit calculated based on end of year invested capital. EOY is end of year, which we're going to use when we do the ROIC tree analysis. <clears throat> I created an ROIC chart, which we're going to use to help us with our valuation, graphs historical ROIC. And I created the actual ROIC tree that you're going to need to do as part of your group project. And again, the model already calculates and prefills it in based on relative references. All, right, so all this is being automatically crunched by the model. Right? Final two tabs I want to talk about are near the beginning, and these are the important tabs called assumptions and ratios. <clears throat> assumptions are just that. They're miscellaneous assumptions that we're going to use in our valuation model. And rather than spreading out the assumptions through multiple tabs, where it'll be hard to figure out where they are, we start dealing with a very complicated model. I want to put them in as few places as possible. So all the assumptions are going to be aggregated on the assumptions tab. I'm also introducing color to the model, and I've chosen the color yellow. You can use whatever color you want. But the key is yellow cells are cells that I can change. Any cell that doesn't have color is something I should not change. Because the model automatically calculates things and has a lot of relative references, I don't want to just arbitrarily change numbers because that could cause problems. So the assumptions that I'm going to focus on, I'm going to highlight in yellow to tell me that's something that I can actually change in my model as I work on the valuation. And you'll see we've already started with a couple of miscellaneous assumptions. I have the last reported year, which is a relative reference. So if a company has a new fiscal year, I just change the year and it changes all the dates across the top. I have operating cash as a percentage of revenue as an assumption, so I can break out excess cash versus operating cash. And I have the WAC as an assumption, so we can calculate the EP. The final assumption, which is a little bit more tricky, <clears throat> is for goodwill and pension obligations. That's just a Bloomberg issue. For whatever reason, if I go back to the Bloomberg exported standardized balance sheet, they export a series of data which goes through row 43. And those always are exported on those rows. But the problem is Bloomberg has a section called reference items, which can be different by company and are not always in the same row. So the two items that I care about that are always in the reference item section are goodwill and pension. So the problem is if I put the Bloomberg data in there, sometimes Pension obligation is on row 50, sometimes it's on row 52. And so if I want to reuse the model, it causes problems. So the two items that are not always in the same place, goodwill and pensions, I put in the <coughs> assumptions tab, and I have to manually copy and paste them there, the historical data, so that the model will continue to balance. Those are the only two cells that I need that aren't always in the same place. So that's why they're there in the assumptions tab. And you'll see when we put in another company's data next week, how we can update that. The final tab, and probably the most important tab in the model, is called ratios. And here is where we're going to do the most of our work. So this is the process that we're going to go through. We're going to use historical financial statements, income statements and balance sheets, and then from those statements, we're going to create historical income statement and balance sheet ratios. We then have to forecast statements. But instead of forecasting the statements directly, what we're going to do is we're going to forecast the ratios. And the forecasted ratios will create the forecasted statements. 
that is a better process for forecasting than directly forecasting the statements. So the ratios serve two purposes. One, <coughs> it gives us the historical ratios, but two, it allows us to forecast the future ratios of the company and therefore the future statements. The future statements will then get us the future cash flows and we'll use those cash flows to value the company. So that's what we're going to do on the next section. Right? So let's start out with our forecast. So I'm going to start out on the ratios tab. I always want to use relative references. I don't want to use absolute references because I want to reuse this model. So I'm going to forecast out 11 years. So we're going to do an 11 year forecast of financial statements. I'm picking 11 years arbitrarily. 10 years of defined period. The 11th year is the start of the continuing value period. Okay, so we always want to forecast a continuing value period. I've arbitrarily chosen an 11 year time horizon. Main reason is that when you do continuing value, you want the company to be in maturity. So I feel that 10 years is probably enough time that all the companies we've selected for valuation will be mature after 10 years. Okay, so I've picked enough periods so that the company is mature, we do the continuing value. So 10 years of direct forecast, year 11 is going to be continuing value. So we're going to forecast, in this case, through 2023. So equals for H1, year plus 1. And then I'm going to copy and paste this out 11 years to 2023. Very important. Do not click and drag. So when you copy, Excel gives you the option to create, to drag that little box across the cells. Don't do it. Excel will screw you up. Excel will make your life miserable, right? Because Microsoft tries to be helpful. And sometimes it's so helpful, it does things that you don't expect it to do. That happened to somebody in the 11 a.m. section. So when they clicked and dragged, they converted her numbers into values for whatever reason. And then her spreadsheet wouldn't add up because Excel didn't understand how to add and subtract values. So if you need to copy and paste, Command C, Control C, depending on your operating system to copy, Command V, Control V to paste. Do not use the click and drag. It will definitely hurt you as you build up this model. For that matter, any other model. So be warned about that. All right. <clears throat> so. What we're then going to do is we're going to forecast our revenue growth rate. As we start building the model, as an initial assumption, we're going to assume <clears throat> that the current year revenue growth rate equals the historical revenue growth rate. So in this case, for H2 equals G2. And I'm going to use the color yellow to highlight that this is a cell that I could change in the future. All right. So again, just as we get started, just to keep it simple, everything just equals 2012 on a repeated basis. I'm going to do the same thing for cost of revenue, also known as cost of goods sold, equals the previous year. I'm going to make that yellow. The next item is gross profit. Here's the deal about gross profit. Gross profit is a result of our cost of goods sold, cost of revenue forecast, because one minus the cost of goods sold, cost of revenue, equals our gross profit. So since I forecasted cost of revenue, I've essentially forecasted gross profit. So for gross profit equals one minus the cost of revenue. I'm not going to make that cell yellow because I don't want to change that cell. All right, so essentially as I built this model, I had to make a choice. And I could either forecast gross profit or I could forecast cost of goods sold. And what I decided to do is to forecast the components that lead to the indicators as opposed to forecasting the indicators. So we're not going to forecast gross profit. We're not going to forecast EBITDA. We're not going to forecast EBIT. We're going to forecast cost of goods sold, SG&A, depreciation, and that will get us gross profit, EBITDA, and EBIT. All right, so we are forecasting them. But we had to choose which one we're going to forecast. Question? Forecasting the revenue growth rate as we did last year compared to the previous year's revenue growth rate, is that going <coughs> to skew it if it's either too high or too low? That's right. So what we're going to do is we build the model. We're just going to leave it as whatever it is last year. Once we've built the model, we can then go in and adjust a, an appropriate percentage growth and then see how it plays through in the model. That's also why we want to use relative references when we build out the model. Okay. So next, operating expenses equals the previous year. Again, I'm going to make that yellow because that's something I'm going to change. 
EBITDA equals gross profit minus operating expenses or SGNA. By the way, you can also check 2012. I put in the calculations in 2012, so you can also use those as references to see where the formulas are going to be. All right, depreciation and amortization equals the previous year. Make that yellow. Operating income or EBIT equals EBITDA minus the DA. Tax rate. What I'm going to do for the tax rate is as a starting assumption, I'm going to take an average tax rate for the previous six years and say that that <coughs> is a representative tax rate for Coca-Cola. Right? <coughs> no plat <coughs> equals operating income times 1 minus the tax rate. So that would be my no plat given that tax rate. And again, the formula for that you can see in cell G10. So G9 minus, oh sorry, H8 times 1 minus H9 would be the formula. Yes? Sorry, what was your factor? So what we're going to do as a starting assumption is we're just going to take an average of the last six years to come up with a representative rate of, of taxes for Coca-Cola in the future. Now later, as I said, if we don't think any of these assumptions are reasonable, we can change them. But as we're building the model, I'm just going to start out with what I'm going to call some baseline assumptions where we're just going to kind of repeat the past all right, as we just build the model. Got to put some placeholders in there. All right. Next, non-operating gains and losses equal the previous year. And again, I'm going to make that yellow. Okay. So what we've just done is we basically forecasted out some of the key income statement ratios. Then I'm going to take these ratios <laughs> copy them, and paste them out through 2023. <coughs> so the starting assumption in our model is what if 2012 repeats itself for the next 11 years? All right. Now the one thing is the tax rate. Because this tax rate is copying that average tax rate out, so it's going to slightly change over time. So what I'm going to do in 2014 is have the tax rate for 2014 equal the tax rate for 2013, the average rate, and I'm going to copy that cell out for the remaining 10 years. So I have an average tax rate, and I'm going to copy out, equal that average tax rate for the next 10 years in my model. I didn't do that? Copy paste. There we go. Thank you. So I am going to just copy and paste out that tax rate equal to the previous year. All right. So given these ratios, these should create forecasts for my income statement. So I'm going to go to my income tab. And on the income tab, I'm going to start creating my income statement forecast. Now you'll see that I've labeled history across the top so that when I print out the income statement, I know that's historical data. And then I'm going to add a label for forecast so that I know if I print this out, the difference between the historical and the forecast period. And again, relative years. I'm forecasting through 2023. So starting in H3 on the income tab equals previous year plus one. And then I'm going to copy and paste that out through column R because I'm going to go out to 2023. Right. Now I'm ready to start creating my 2013 forecasted income statement. So on the ratios tab, I have an assumption in 2013 that the revenue will grow by 3.2%. So what I'm going to do on the income tab for revenue equals previous year revenue, so G3, times left paren 1 plus from the ratios tab, 2013 revenue growth rate, right paren. So what that means is that if my revenue grows by 3%, it's 3.2%, it's going to grow to 49,538.75. Now just so it's consistently formatted, I'm going to format this as currency to one decimal place. <coughs> and actually, I'm going to format this whole column as currency to one decimal place. 
Question? I basically take previous year sales and I multiply it by one minus the revenue growth rate. And the revenue growth rate is the 2013 revenue growth rate from the ratios tab. Oh, sorry. Did I say one minus? Thank you. One plus. One plus, one plus, plus, plus. It's on the video. Sorry, when I've been doing this, this is my third time today. I kind of forget. So you guys keep me straight. Thanks. All right. <clears throat> Next, cost of revenue equals 2013 forecasted revenue times, from our ratios tab, 2013 cost of revenue as a percentage of sales. So if my revenue is 35.6% of sales, then my cost of revenue is 17,612. Gross profit equals revenue minus cost of revenue. You can kind of see the signs over here. Right? Next, operating expenses equals 2013 forecasted revenue times, from the ratios tab, 2013 operating expenses as a percentage of revenue. EBITDA equals gross profit minus operating expenses. Depreciation equals 2013 revenue times ratios, 2013 depreciation amortization as a percentage of sales. Operating income or EBIT equals EBITDA minus the DA, 11,120.6. Right? So basically, just using those ratios, we've created a forecast for the 2013 income statement numbers all the way down through operating income. Yes? Right now it is. But as I said, don't do this. To answer that question that was just asked in the video, <clears throat> for example, what if this grows at 4% and this changes to 37%? Then <clears throat> everything here is adjusted. Right? Don't do this in the video. Undo, undo. It's okay. <clears throat> so this is the number that you should have in the video. Yes? So could you explain how you got the operating Operating expenses is the 2013 revenue forecast times from the ratios tab <clears throat> the operating expenses as a percentage of that revenue, so H5. So that's, that's the similar process that we're repeating. Now, <clears throat> when we get down to interest expense, a couple of new assumptions. The assumption we're going to make on interest expense is this. <clears throat> when we do an enterprise DCF, we assume a constant capital structure into the future constant target capital structure. Therefore, we're not going to change the amount of debt or equity that the firm has. Therefore, we're not going to change the debt. Interest expense is going to stay the same. Won't affect the valuation. We just need a placeholder for interest. So in this case, equals the previous year's interest expense. <clears throat> Foreign exchange gains or losses equals the previous year's. Right, which for Coke happens to be zero in this case. For net non-operating gains and losses equals... 2013 revenue times ratios, 2013 operating gains and losses as percentage of revenue. Pre-tax income equals operating income minus those three items. Minus this, minus that, minus that. Again, you can see I'm following the format over here on the left. 12,195.8. Right? Income tax expense. If my pre-tax income is this amount, I'm going to multiply that by my forecasted 2013 tax rate. That would be my taxes. Income before extraordinary items equals pre-tax income minus the taxes. 9490.1. Extraordinary items loss net of tax. Here's the general assumption we're going to make on extraordinary or one-time items. We're going to treat them as one-time. So if a company really has one-time items, they shouldn't recur in the future. So therefore, we're not going to forecast one-time items in the future. So for extraordinary loss of tax, zero. Minority interest. Same capital structure, same minority interest, 
same payments of the minority shareholders equals the previous year. Net income equals extraordinary items, income before extraordinary items, minus those two, 9423.1. Preferred dividends. If a company has preferred stock, we're going to keep the same amount of preferred stock outstanding. Therefore, the same dividends on that preferred stock equals the previous year. Other adjustments. These are one-time adjustments based on accounting rule changes to companies' financial statements. Therefore, we're going to assume that we're not going to predict one-time accounting rule changes in the future. Zero. Net income available to common shareholders equals net income minus preferred minus other adjustments. Abnormal gains, one-time items. Those shouldn't recur in the future. It's ironic that Coke has one-time gains for five straight years, or six straight years, but we're going to assume that they don't have any in the future. Zero. Therefore, the normalized income equals net income to common shareholders minus abnormal equals normalized income. Now, after we build the model out, if you really believe you want to forecast a one-time gain or loss for a company in the future, you could change one of these that we've put at zero and make it an actual assumption. All right, but now as we build the model, it really won't affect our valuations, and I'm just trying to simplify a few things by making a couple less things that we have to forecast. So I'm going to make that zero. Dividends. Whatever dividends we paid, we're going to keep paying. <clears throat> Equals the previous year. Change in retained earnings. Net income minus dividends, whatever's left, gets added to our future retained earnings. <clears throat> because this is coming from the cash flow statement as a negative item, equals normalized income plus the negative dividends. So my change in retained earnings is 4828.1. That's how much my retained earnings should go up by after I pay those dividends. All right. So what we've basically done is using the ratios, we have created a forecast for the 2013 income statement. Now, the last step. I copy all of these numbers and I paste them out through 2023. So what I've actually done is I've created an income statement forecast for Coke for the next 11 years. Now again, what this is currently assuming is that the ratios in 2012 stay constant. Later, we'll adjust the ratios and we'll adjust the statements, but we very quickly created a forecast for the next 11 years. Yes? Just copy-paste at this point. Regular paste. You don't want to paste values, you want to paste the relative references. So you want to paste the formulas too. Right. So, now I go to my statement of TII. The TII is mapped to the income statement. It's the rearranged income statement. Since I've mapped it with relative references, I just take column G, I copy this out 11 years to column R, and paste it, I now have 11 years of forecasted TII. Change my years to relative references, highlight the columns, make them a little bit wider, and I now have, more importantly, 11 years of balancing TIIs, because everything is mapped correctly. So just take 2012, copy it, Go out to column R, paste it. <clears throat> Years equals 2012 plus 1. Copy that. Paste that. So just copied and pasted. Well, that's the point. <clears throat> I forecasted the income statement, which means I've essentially forecasted my TII. All right? We're about to go through the same process for the balance sheet. So <clears throat> to go back to the ratios. Now, <clears throat> when we forecast the balance sheet ratios, these are the nine balance sheet ratios I've chosen to forecast okay, as part of our valuation model. <clears throat> as we did with the income statement, we're going to start out by having these ratios equal the previous year. And I'm going to make them yellow. I'm going to then copy this and paste this out for the 11 years. So again, the 2012 balance sheet just gets copied out 11 years. 
terms of ratios. Now here's the thing about the balance sheet. In the book, it talks about creating the ratios for the balance sheet based on the appropriate income statement driver. Translation, you forecast day sales outstanding based on revenue. You forecast cost, uh, sorry, inventory based on cost of goods sold. You forecast accounts payable based on accounts of cost of goods sold. For simplicity, we're forecasting the entire balance sheet as a percentage of revenue. In reality, it doesn't make much of a difference if we do it this way, and it's far easier. So we're going to use this assumption. It also puts in another assumption into our model that we're going to use essentially constant productivity. What that means is as revenue grows, we're going to have to spend more on the balance sheet because everything's a percentage of revenue. Okay, that's the initial assumption we're going to make on the balance sheet. Okay, so <clears throat> given that we have forecasted the balance sheet ratios, we're now going to go to the balance tab and we're going to start creating the forecasted balance sheets. It's a little bit smaller, so they all fit on the same page. So 2013, that's going to be my forecast period, which I'm going to identify <clears throat> equals previous year plus one. Copy that out through column R, paste out the 2023. Right now. <clears throat> As I forecast the balance sheet, I'm going to start out with my ratios, and the first one is accounts and notes receivable. So, back to the balance sheet. Accounts receivable equals ratios, accounts and notes receivable as a percentage of revenue in 2013, times, from my income tab, 2013 forecasted revenue. 4909.8. And again, I'm going to take this column, format, cells, currency, one decimal place. So on the income tab, it's the 2013 revenue. Everything is a function of revenue, all the ratios. So 2013 revenue times <clears throat> accounts and notes receivable as a percentage of revenue. Okay, I'm going to do the same thing with inventory. So for inventory equals 2013 inventory as a percentage of sales times from the income tab 2013 forecasted revenue. Other current assets, same process. In fact, I'll go the other way. From the income tab, 2013 revenue times ratios 2013 other current assets as a percentage of revenue. Long-term investments equals from the ratios tab. Long-term investments as a percentage for 2013 times from the income tab 2013 forecasted revenue. The next one is net fixed assets equals ratios 2013 net fixed assets times income 2013 revenue. Next is other long-term assets equals ratios other long-term assets times income 2013 revenue. Next one is accounts payable equals ratios Accounts payable as a percentage of revenue times income 2013 revenue. Other short term liabilities equals to other short term liabilities as a percentage of revenue times income 2013 revenue. And finally, other long term liabilities equals ratios. Other long-term liabilities as a percentage of revenue times income 2013 revenue. So those are the nine ratios essentially forecasted out on the balance sheet. Okay. So again, what we're setting up, and please don't do what I'm about to do on the video, 
But what we're setting up is I can come in here eventually, and right now my net fixed assets are forecast to be 14.9 billion. I could come here to the ratios and say, what if Coke started spending 35% on net fixed assets? And on the balance sheet, it would then change the net fixed assets to 17.3 billion. Okay? So again, the model is set up to do the what ifs by changing the things in the yellow, and everything automatically flows through. Don't do that in the video. I'm going to undo that change. And we should have 14,934.8. The last item that we have to forecast is operating cash in terms of percentages. Operating cash is on the assumptions tab. This is one of the catch-all assumptions. Because <clears throat> generally for operating cash, we use the same operating cash in the future. It wouldn't change year by year. So it's operating cash right now set at 2% of revenue. So here's what I'm going to do on the balance sheet equals ratios, or sorry, assumptions, 2% operating cash, assumptions B3, times income, 2013 income, revenue, from the income statement. So 990.8. Here's the deal. I need to make this an absolute reference. Because when I copy and paste it, I want it to always refer to assumptions B3, I need to put a dollar sign in front of the B, what's called a string in Excel, and a dollar sign in front of the three. That makes it an absolute reference in Excel. So that means when I copy and paste this forward, it'll always refer to cell B3. If I don't put the dollar sign in front of the B and the three, <coughs> then when I copy and paste, it'll say C3, D3, E3, F3, and there's only one data point in the assumptions tab. So then it'll, it'll give me zeros. So that's why we're using the absolute reference there of the B3. All right, now we're going to finish up the balance sheet. What's important when we finish up the balance sheet is that we get a balancing balance sheet with no circular references. If you have a circular reference in the model, you have a flawed model. Therefore, we cannot have a circular reference in the model. So I'm going to show you how to complete a balancing balance sheet forecasted correctly without a circular reference in Excel. <clears throat> the easiest way to do it is to start out by forecasting the liabilities and equity. <coughs> so we're going to finish that side of the balance sheet first. I'm going to start out with retained earnings. Here's what I know about retained earnings. The current year's retained earnings should be the previous year's retained earnings plus, from the income statement, the 2013 change in retained earnings. So that's how much would be added to the retained earnings after dividends were paid. So my retained earnings should go to 24,479.1. Okay. So I know from accounting that net income minus dividends is my change in retained earnings. Add that to previous year's retained earnings, I get my current year's retained earnings. Okay. That's how we're linking up the income statement to the balance sheet. Share capital. <coughs> and additional paid in capital. Because we're going to assume <coughs> a constant, constant capital structure, we're going to assume that the company doesn't issue any more shares. Therefore, equals the previous year. Minority interest, same minority interest in the future. And if they have any preferred stock, same preferred stock in the future as in the past. Okay. So then if I sum those up, I get my total equity. 37,996.1. I now start filling out my liabilities. Short-term liabilities. Since I'm not changing my capital structure, I'm leaving whatever debt I have currently outstanding. Therefore, equals the previous year's debt. Total current liabilities, the sum of the three above. Next, my long-term debt, <clears throat> long-term borrowings, equal the previous year. Same reason. I don't change the capital structure. I leave my long-term debt alone. <clears throat> so my long-term debt stays constant, equals the previous year. Next, pension liabilities, equal the previous year. Under U.S. accounting law, companies are not allowed to run long-term pension deficits. Therefore, whatever pension deficit they have will keep, 
but any new pension deficits we're going to assume will be fully funded. So the company will not increase its pension deficit in the future on our baseline assumptions. All right, they'll be treated as NPV zero. So therefore, we're going to leave the pension liabilities as is. I then add up my long-term liabilities, which is the sum of the three things above. Total liabilities equal my current liabilities plus my long-term liabilities. Finally, <laughs> liabilities and equity equals total liabilities plus equity. Total liabilities and equity, 91, 543.6. So I basically forecasted the liabilities and equity side of my balance sheet. Now my balance sheet has to balance. So here's how I'm going to ensure that happens. I'm going to set my assets to be equal to my liabilities and equity. I'm going to force my balance sheet to balance, which means I'm going to need a plug on the asset side. The plug to make sure the balance sheet balances is going to be excess cash. Excess cash is our plug. That's what we're going to solve for to make sure the balance sheet balances. So, if I look through my asset categories, there's really three asset categories left to be forecast. The first are gross, at, gross fixed assets and accumulated depreciation. Now, since I've forecasted net fixed assets, I don't really need to forecast gross fixed assets, right? Because gross is a function of the net. Right, usually net is a function of the gross, right? But what I've already forecasted is the net, and that's what I care about. So I'm not even going to worry about the gross, and I'm not going to worry about the accumulated depreciation because those are just accounts I won't use. I'll care about the net, PP&E, for my invested capital. So that's why I forecasted that one directly, but I'm not going to worry about forecasting those other two items. The final item is goodwill. Under current U.S. accounting rules, <clears throat> goodwill stays on your books forever. So any goodwill you have, they do an impairment test, but as long as it's not impaired, it stays there forever. So equals the previous year. The assumption we're going to make on M&A is that companies either don't do M&A in the future or any M&A they do is NPV zero. So therefore, we're only going to forecast what they currently have. We're not going to predict any future values of acquisitions. Too difficult to do in the valuation world. So we're just going to value the current assets, so we're going to leave the current goodwill alone. Equals the previous year. All right. So, we're now ready to finish up our balance sheet. Excess cash, this is our plug, equals total assets minus everything else, minus operating cash, minus accounts receivable, minus inventory, minus other current assets, minus long-term investments, minus net fixed assets, minus goodwill, minus other long-term assets, 19111.7. If you're able to do this and you don't have a circular reference, then you did it correctly. If you have a circular reference, then you made a mistake. Yes? Now we can go back in and we can sum the current assets. And now we can go back in and we can sum the long-term assets. And we still don't have a circular reference. Does changing the excess cash do not change the total long-term assets? Well, what, like I said, because it's a plug, it works the other way around. If we change our long-term assets, we change our excess cash. So if the way the model would work, so again, don't do this in the video. I'm just responding to a question. If I were to raise my net fixed assets to 35%, notice that to keep the balance sheet balancing, I use cash to do that, and my cash balance goes down. I'm going to undo that. I was just answering a question. Don't do this in your homework assignment. <clears throat> All right. So again, for your homework assignment, this is what you have to replicate. Question. So again, excess cash is just total assets minus everything else. So I'll leave it on here, but it's total assets minus operating cash, <clears throat> minus accounts and notes receivable, minus inventory, minus other current assets, minus long-term investments, minus net fixed assets, minus goodwill, and minus other long-term assets. 
anything that's not a summed category, because then I'd be double counting. And that's where I get into the circular references. Right. So essentially, <clears throat> this becomes my excess cash balance. Yes? <clears throat> well, I don't want to do it because I'm recording this with a video, but the point is, if I have a circular reference, then what would happen <clears throat> is Excel would tell me I have a circular reference because one number is calculated based on another number. Okay, So what you don't want to do is you don't want to have one number calculated based on another number. So for example, here's I'll, I think I can undo this. So if I can in the video, I apologize. But one thing I could do is if I subtract excess cash. So what's that, H5? So if I, <clears throat> if I tried to subtract H5, because I'm already calculating the cell, then it'll tell me you can't do it. That would be an example of a circular reference, because I'm using a cell to calculate the same cell. All right. If for some reason you're copying and pasting by mistake, and you get a circular reference, notice that's now 0. So let me un undo that then you basically have to solve for that circular reference. Yeah? Um, when you did this for the last set step, mm -hmm. you should be doing one that you have That's right. All right, we're almost done. <clears throat> now, we go to tee up, change in equity. Oh, sorry, before we do, I have to copy and paste this out to 2023. But I now have a forecast. <clears throat> And those pound signs just mean it's not big enough to see the numbers. <clears throat> but I now have a forecast of a balancing balance sheet going out through 2023. I then go to my change in equity. Change in equity. Select, copy, paste that out to 2023 as well. <clears throat> Again, relative references for the years equal current year plus one. Copy. And <clears throat> make these a little bit wider just so that I can see the numbers. <clears throat> TFI. TFI is the rearranged balance sheet. Now that I have forecasted balance sheet, copy, paste out 11 years worth of TFIs. Put in my relative references for the years. I now have 11 years worth of forecasted TFIs that, most importantly, continue to balance. CFI. <clears throat> this one's a little tricky <clears throat> just because I left in a total column which sums up the five years. When you work on your group projects, you're going to have to do a five-year historical CFI analysis. So I'm totaling up the historical five years. I want to leave those columns in there. So what I'm going to do is starting with the total column, I'm going to highlight all the way through column R, and I'm going to insert the 11 blank columns. Then I'm going to copy and paste my CFI. Copy CFI from H to R. And again, relative references for the years. But what's very important is that I have balancing CFIs going into the future, right? which notice are 4970.9. Yes? Undo it and do it again. <clears throat> All right, so <clears throat> here's a question I might ask in the final exam. Why does the CFI stay 4970.9 constant? For 11 years. Why doesn't it change? Yeah. Every year based on the values of the previous year just based on the last year. Well, not just that, but remember what we said about the capital structure. Are we changing the debt of the firm? No. Are we changing the interest of the firm? No. Are we changing the dividends of the firm? Are we buying or back or issuing new shares? No. So therefore, the cash flow that we're paying out to investors doesn't change. It stays constant. So that's why the CFI doesn't change. Matter of fact, how does the statement balance? Where does the extra cash go since I'm not paying it out? It gets accumulated in excess cash. So what we'll talk about next week 
is the way to think about the excess cash balance is that is the cash that's the discretionary cash that can be used to pay out. All right. So really, when we think about CFI, CFI is what you pay out plus any excess cash that you have that theoretically could be paid out. That's the way to think about excess cash. That's why it actually works this way in this model. All right. <clears throat> EPBOY. Take out 2012. Copy that out 11 years. Again, equals previous year plus one. Do the same thing for EPEOY. Copy, paste, years, copy, paste, done. If you get to this point, you have successfully completed this part of the homework. This is where we're going to start in our next section, in our next class. So we'll start here, and then what we're going to do is then we're going to add the valuation tabs. Okay. So again, let's think process at a very high level. What we've done is we've taken historical income statements and balance sheets, and we've forecasted 11 years of forecasted income statements and balance sheets. We then take those forecasted statements and created forecasted cash flows. All right? We're going to use those forecasted cash flows to add the valuation to the model. We're then going to value those cash flows with a DCF valuation and an economic profit valuation, which will match each other. That's what we're going to do on the next class. What you're going to have to do is if you recreate this plus what we do in the next class, that's what you're going to have to submit. And as long as everything matches, then you'll get full credit on your homework. This is an individual assignment, and I want you to do it individually. Mainly because I could have just given you this model fully built. But then, when you're using it, you'll have no idea why things are actually doing what they do. By making you build it yourself, you should have a general idea about why things are actually changing and how the model starts to work with each other. That's why I think it's important to do this as an individual assignment, so that when you work on your group project, you're going to do divisional labor. There's probably going to be one or two members of your group that will use this model to value your group company. But individually, I want you to do this. And as I said, what we've built with all these relative references is a reusable model. So that in about 20 minutes next Wednesday, we're going to pick a company, we'll put it into this model, and we'll be able to have the baseline numbers ready to go so we can start changing assumptions and come up with final valuations. So on Wednesday of this week, in our next class, we'll add the valuation tabs. On Monday of next week, one week from today, we'll then go through and we'll finish up the valuation of Coca-Cola. Then we'll repeat this with another company next Wednesday and for the succeeding classes after that until your group projects are due. So we'll do lots of practice with the valuation, lots of practice with the four sections of your group project with the analytics. So that's what I'm saying. In terms of new content, once we finish the model, we're kind of done with content for the semester and we'll be focusing most of our time on the evaluations.